Thank you all for being here. We have some who are visiting with us from different places. We're glad that you're here and hope that you feel welcome and we'll come back any opportunity you have. The lesson that I'm going to talk about this morning is crucial in our times. We live in a strange time. It seems to be getting stranger. Every time we turn around and look at the news, uh, we begin to realize something's going on. What is going on with our world? And we really shouldn't be surprised and shocked because the foundations of our country, premises that we once built ideology, are, have been abandoned and replaced. Humanism means that you exalt man above everything else. Because that's what you see. You see that, you see man with your physical eye. And you don't consider an invisible God. And if you did, which God would you consider? So all of that has been thrown out the door. And people believe that we ought to just devote our minds, our will, our intentions, our moral principles. We should just abandon whatever we thought that we got from the Bible and just go with the flow of what human wisdom presents to us. As a result, we're seeing a whole lot of things that are strange to our ears. And the next generation will get used to that. And it will even be stranger than it is now. Now, the reason I want to present this lesson is because it is important that every one of us, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, that every Christian needs to have this, that you've set the Lord apart in your heart. That is, you sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Every Christian has got to do that. And be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. And do that with meekness and fear. But do it. Be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that's within you. You've got a hope within you. Surely there's got to be a good reason for it. Every Christian has got to know the reasons If you don't know the reasons, then you're easy pickings for any concept that comes along. So I'm going to place before us three religious books because the humanists will say, well, why should I believe the Bible? I mean, don't come at me with the Bible. There are other people that have religious books as well. So shouldn't I go with the Book of Mormon or maybe the Koran? What what makes you think that your book is any better than anybody else's? That's the, that's the approach that you have got to be ready to tackle. Because the humanist and the atheist, the skeptic, are going to come at you with that question. And if you're not prepared, you'll say, well, uh, just because I always have. And they'll say, well, the Mormons always have. And the Islamic people, the Muslims always have. And so well, that's no good reason. And so your, your approach now, the approach now has got to be that you're prepared to give a reason for the hope that's within you. And that that reason has got to be a solid reason. It's got to be a good reason. How are you going to convince a, a skeptic? Now in the past, yes, most people in this country used to believe that the Bible was the Word of God. You could pretty well take that for granted that you could take the Bible and show them this is what the Word of God says. And people would either uh, say, uh, well, I believe, uh, I believe you probably misapplied that. Or, or they might say, oh, well, let me think about that. <laughs> but everybody's got to hear and see for themselves, why do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God and not the Book of Mormon or the Koran? Do you have better reasons for that than they do? And my answer, of course, is absolutely. 
Now, there was a time when I didn't understand that, and I understand the question and the power of that question. Are the Koran, the Book of Mormon, and the Bible on an equal plane? And can you demonstrate that there is a difference? Our schools have been inundated with humanistic philosophy. It says you explain everything naturally. Even if in reality, everything didn't happen naturally. But that's what they're going to explain. They're going to say it, was, uh, it happened naturally over a course of billions of years. And, and time is the, is the champion of what came about naturally. They begin with a philosophy. And of course, they couldn't prove that philosophy if they had to. But it results in people then being able to decide right and wrong by human wisdom alone. And so every man does what is right in his own eyes. That's how things get out of hand because everybody has a different value system and they develop it differently. So it is very, very important to us in our work of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, that this is one of the questions that's going to come at you, and you've got to be prepared. Do you know why you believe the Bible over these other books? And what would you do? How would you approach this? How would you convince somebody that the Bible is the Word of God, not these other books? There are three tests that you can use. And these are crucial tests because when you apply these tests, you apply them equally to any of these three and maybe any other new uh, book that comes on the scene. These three tests can be summarized with these words. If you have a book and it has a bibliography in the back of it, what that bibliography is telling you is here's a bunch of sources for this material. So what we are saying now is that we're looking at the sources by which we have the words of Jesus Christ, the words of God. What sources do we rely upon? Well, we don't have the apostles' first handwritten copy. So we can't check by it. And, and even if there was one that survived, there would be dispute over whether that was actually one that the apostles actually touched pen and ink to paper or whichever papyrus. And, and, and so what we're looking at is all the copies that have taken place since the apostles originally wrote their copies, their, uh, their first Uh, manuscripts. Now what we are saying then is that there have been copies, copies, copies over a period of time and these copies have been checked against one another. It's kind of like if I were to give this test. If I were to quote to you a sentence, maybe a paragraph, and I'm going to say to you, get your pen and paper out and, and, and I'm going to dictate this to you. And everyone writes down as best they can, as fast as they can, what I said. Then I take them all up and I compare them. And some of you may not be good spellers. And so you may not spell some of the words correctly. Some of you may have skipped some of the V's and uh, ands and maybe some of the other words because you were in a hurry and you, you got ahead of yourself. So as we gather up, how many people here, uh, say, just say 150 participated in this. What you would look at then is, I'm going to reproduce what I said to you. I've got the original in front of me, but I'm going to burn it. And I'm going to depend on your copies now. And we're going to check them by one another. For the most part, we would easily be able to reproduce without any serious doubt. Yes, there would be some misspellings, there would be some flaws in some of it, but we could rule them out just by comparison. So what we're saying is in in regard to our Bibles, we have so many copies 
manuscripts, versions, and quotations through the years that by comparing them all, you can root out the, the things that were probably a mistake on the part of the copier. But you've got all of these things that bring us then to having a version of, uh, of the apostles' teaching that tells us what they said. And is it reliable? The bibliographical test, then you would use that against the Bible. You would use it for the Book of Mormon. You would use it for the Koran and any other book because that test is very, very crucial. So that's one of the tests, and we'll explain that a little bit more. But three tests, then. You've got to look at your sources, your bibliographical test. Then you look at inside the book itself. Look inside the Book of Mormon. Look inside the Koran. Look inside the Bible. Of those three, you look at the internal qualities that are there. What is it talking about? Does it have a theme to it? Does it have a unity of purpose? I mean, when you look at Moses and you look at um, Jeremiah and you look at Isaiah... You look at all these prophets and you look at their material. What is their goal? What is their aim? Do they have a unity of purpose? Are they, are they united in trying to get us to somewhere with their material? And then when you look at the New Testament, they're looking back at Jesus Christ and saying, here's what we saw and here's what we touched. Here's what our hands have held. And this is the, this is the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you've got, you got a unity of theme here, internal evidence, that tells us that they have a, a chain of purpose involved in it. And then you apply that to the Book of Mormon. Do they have an internal purpose, a unity of theme? And look at that internal evidence and see what you say. Look inside the book and see what it says for itself. Does it claim to be the Word of God? And if it claims it, does it show itself to be the Word of God? Now, there would be some internal tests you could use there. For example, if we're talking about the Word of God, then we would have special supernatural knowledge. That is, knowledge ahead of its time. That would be prophetic in nature. And if the Book of Mormon and the Koran are equal on that basis as the Bible, then you'd have reason to say, well, they're just all three equal on the internal evidence alone. You've got just as many prophecies and the fulfillment of them has been clearly brought about over a period of time. And, and so you would have internal evidence to go on. But if one stands out in the prophetic nature of it and the others do not have that quality, then the two might fail the test. And so you would see then that it is very important to know what's inside those books, the internal evidence. The third test, of course, would be, can you go outside the book and see from inside the book it talked about such and such an event that took place at such and such a place? Was that a real place? Was that a real place in time? Or was that more like a fairy tale? Was it more like Never Never Land, that they never tell you any specifics about where it happened and when it happened? Externally, can you find the places that it talks about? Can you find the times and the rulers and the governors that ruled at that time? Can you find artifacts that support it? That's going outside. That's external evidence that would be used then to say, that this book is credible. What it says inside is, is credible because you can compare it with the things that are said or that are known on the outside. Supportive evidence from the outside. So those three things are crucial tests to test any claimed book that claims to be a divine book, a book of God. So let's look at these three tests and explain them a little further. The biographical test or bibliographical test, is how close in time to the events were these writers. Of course, the claim is by the biblical writers is that they were eyewitnesses. They were there and they saw Jesus. So in closeness of time, these, these men said that they saw him. Our hands have handled him. And so that's how close in time they were. 
Now that means then that they gave their testimony. And then it was copied, and then it was copied and shared with others, and copied and copied and copied and shared with others. How close in time are the earliest copies that we have? When we compare the copies, do we see a lot of big changes in story? Is the storyline changing as we look at these copies? Or when you look at the copies, do they pretty well stay the same in the story that they're telling? I'm not saying in the spelling. I'm not saying in every detail, but is the story the same? How close are our earliest copies? And then you use that on the Book of Mormon. And you use that on the Koran or any other religion. How close in time to the events were the writers? Bibliographically, we would have to have some basis for deciding that these particular documents outshine the other source documents for the other two books. How many copies are available? It's really important to be able to compare them. Like I said a while ago in the illustration, I said if, if you all copied or something that I dictated to you, I know that there'd be a few errors in spelling, maybe a drop word or here or there. You might have put a name in the wrong place. You might, they might be, but overall, as we checked one another and compared them, we could eliminate what was most likely an error and what most likely was not by the comparison process. How many copies are available to compare with one another? All of them were not written in the same place. We're not copied in the same place. We're not copied in the same time. So over time, as you look at these copies, what do you find as you make comparison? The bibliographical test then would be applied equally to any other historical work as well. How much change in the copies through the years do you see by comparing those copies? Do you see a lot? Do you see very little? Do you see none? Those are things that you have to look from the bibliographical evidence. Then as you look at those things and apply those particular tests, you look at the internal evidence themselves. Is there continuity of theme as we said? What is the objective of this writing, this material? Does it have an objective? person who started with Genesis 1, for example, and he finishes uh, his, his uh, book of Genesis, does he, does he seem to be going somewhere with this material? Or was it a complete end to itself? Just here's the beginning and, and here's the end, and it's kind of a closed book. Or does it kind of just open up to something else that seems to be coming in the future? What is the objective of this particular book that we're looking at? You do that with the Book of Mormon. You do it with the Koran as well. Does it seem to have a continuity of theme and an objective that they're trying to get the reader to come to? Is there a consistency in the writings? It's important that they, that, that they be consistent in their storyline, be consistent in their objective, and be consist, uh, consistent with the facts that they tell. Do they contradict themselves? Do they tell one fact here and then a contradictory fact at another place? There is consistency or there is inconsistency. Those things would tell us whether or not it is credible on the surface of it. And then I think we've mentioned this too. Fulfill prophecy would certainly be something only God could do. This is not human material because humans can't prophesy these things in advance. Especially hundreds of years ahead of time. And it be fulfilled. And so if you can, you can identify when this particular book was written. And then see its fulfillment hundreds of years later be able to demonstrate that that was the case historically from the external evidence, look at it from the internal evidence to the external evidence, then the fulfilled prophecy would be a standout that says this is from God, this one is not from God. Now, on the external test again, historical accuracy. When it talks about facts, maybe it talks about empires, 
Maybe it talks about kingdoms of men. Maybe it talks about some rulers. Maybe it gives you some information that from secular history you can compare it and say, well, it it lines up historically. It looks credible from a historical standpoint that it has continuity that, that clearly fits a historical timeline. And matches the things that we know historically, secularly, from outside that source. And then we mentioned geographically. What if it speaks of places and those places never existed? Or maybe it tells the contours of of a land and it doesn't match the facts. Is it geographically accurate? And is there any archaeological support? Those are the external things that you would search for. And let me say this. In my comparison, here's my conclusion. There is no, without exception, there is no ancient work historically, whether you're talking about a religious work or a historical work, secularly. There is no ancient work that is better attested than the Bible. I'm not saying that out of, uh, out of prejudice. I'm saying that out of fact. There is no ancient work that is better attested than the Bible. So, we're going to look at it in just a moment. Here are some things to think about. The Bible has some 24,000 manuscripts, copies, ancient translations, where you went into Latin, you went into uh, Uh, Arabic, you went into various languages. And although as it was translated from Hebrew to Greek and and into various languages out of the Old Testament, the New Testament from Greek to whatever language, when you look at all the ancient translations of it and you make the comparisons and, and then you look at some of the church fathers and, and see them quoting large sections of it. And every time they quoted it, it matches what the other material shows as, as well. And so they're all the same. When you look at all of that, you have in the bibliographical test some 24,000 pieces of historical evidence to compare. Now that says a lot because we also know historically that there were those who were trying to burn every copy of the Bible that they could get. So it's amazing that it has survived to the degree that it has. And yet it is still, in spite of all the burning and in spite of all the opposition, the Bible has survived far better historically than any other ancient manuscript. Some of, the, uh, uh, some of these manuscripts and copies are within 40 to 100 years of the original. So it doesn't matter how far into history you go from that point on, every one of them looks the same. Then you compare that to other works, for example, and this is, I'm going to update this a little bit. It used to be that you only had 643 copies of Homer's Iliad. Now there are 1,757 manuscripts of Homer's Homer's Iliad. So I'm going to change that later. But it doesn't matter. Even if it's three times that or four times that, it still doesn't even come within range of the biblical evidence in bibliographical uh, copies to compare. Demosthenes had 200 copies. And I would say this, the earliest one that you have to him was 1,500 years past his time. And yet we do not believe that by comparing what we do have that there is reason to doubt the original, uh, what we have is, is most likely what the original was. Tacitus, in his annals, 
used to be tw- uh, uh, 20 copies. That's updated now to 31. Still, the earliest that we had was some 900 years after he wrote it. In other words, we don't have the actual hand copied, written of a copy that he wrote. We don't have that. We have copies of copies of copies way on out. But that doesn't matter. We still believe that by comparing the copies that we have a reason, no reason to believe that it's been altered significantly in these copies. Of Caesar's work, this is updated from 10 copies now to 251 copies. But still... 800 years later than he wrote them. Meaning that we depend on later copies, even though we're trusting that the copying method and the copying source had no reason to alter it, even though we're missing 800 or 900 years of time. We believe that historical documents usually keep their accuracy when copied over periods of time simply because men are conscientious about not trying to alter what somebody else's work has been uh, given or displayed to be. Of Herodotus, we have eight copies at one time. Now we have 60 copies Still, a thousand years later than he actually wrote them. But we do not doubt history just because we don't have copies of the original. And so what I'm saying is the bibliographical evidence tested way on out confirms that there is not a lot of change that changes uh, way on out. So now we take that bibliographical test and we apply that to the Koran. The Koran was written in the 600s. Muhammad lived in the 600s. Muhammad was not a very educated man. He was very illiterate. Now, he believed that, that Allah, God, spoke to him and gave him inspired revelations. And so he would give these quotations that he would give to to his disciples. They in turn would memorize what he did. And then they would start setting them down to print. What we have is a refining process. Caliph Uthman from 644 to 656 pieced together memorized surahs. These are the same thing as what we call chapters. So surahs are chapters. They would piece together these memorized surahs. And then Caliph Uthman then would uh, render his verdict as to what variations need to be burned. And so it was kind of sorted and finally, they came to a standard, standardized final that uh, su- survived being eliminated. What you have then in the Koran is not a lot of documental, documented evidence of an original. Not a lot of copying of an original document. There was no original document. There were just memories of quotations. And then you trusted that this particular caliph got it right. And then you started copying from him. So now we have something quite different in the Koran as far as the bibliographical evidence is concerned. The Book of Mormon, there are no texts. The Book of Mormon actually comes from Joseph Smith's claim to have seen some golden plates. He claimed that an angel, Moroni, came to him and revealed to him some golden plates, which disappeared. He stuck his head in, uh, in an area that was unseen to others, kind of like putting his head over a, uh, under a blanket, 
And he brought in these stones and he started writing things. And nobody ever saw the original. There was no original. So when you look at the product of the Book of Mormon, you have a conglomeration of things. You have a lot of quotations lifted from the 1611 King James Bible. Interesting that you get 1611 English language style, but you're claiming that the book originated in the 700s before English language developed that way. It is a book also that combat lifts large sections out of the 1611 Bible and combines that with the, a book that was being circulated in his day in the 1830s about the origin of the American Indians that were here when Europeans started coming to this land. So the Book of Mormon then, if it had a correct book, bibliography, it would tell you that my, our original sources are 1611 Bible. And the book that tells us the story of the American Indians. But no copies of any original and so, therefore, you have to look at that and say, well, that's, that's different. And it relies upon the credibility of the Bible to start with. It says that I believe the Bible, but this is an, another revelation in addition to the Bible. And you look at the internal evidence of the Bible. It has a unity of theme. Well, that theme is, is there's a coming Savior. You sinned, you need a Savior, and He's coming. There's a seed line you can follow. Here's genealogy. Here's prophecy of which, which tribe He'll come from. Here's a unity of theme all the way from the very beginning all the way to the end of the Bible. Prophets pointing to this Messiah. Detailed uh, genealogies leading up to the Messiah. I witness testimony in the New Testament saying here he is and here are his credentials. Here's what he did. Here's unity of theme. Prophecies of the Messiah hundreds of years in advance. Some of the prophecies about the downfall of cities like Nineveh. Cities like Babylon who were flourishing kingdoms and yet the Bible would say, these prophets would say this kingdom is going to befall. This kingdom will fall and never be rebuilt. This king will fall, a kingdom will fall, but it may be rebuilt later. This city, Jerusalem, is going to fall, and then it was rebuilt, and then it fell again, and then was rebuilt, and then it fell the third time, and it's not going to be rebuilt. You see, the prophecies of the Bible and the prophecies of Jesus Christ mount up the internal evidence in a tremendously impressive way that you do not see characteristic of the Koran or the Book of Mormon. Types and shadows of Jesus alone throughout the Old Testament is impressive because how did they know to make the stories fit this Messiah that hasn't even come yet? And how do they know he's going to come? And how is it going to fit the, uh, all of this? The Bible has no rival at all in the internal kind of evidence. There is nothing like it on the face of the earth. The internal evidence of the Koran, though, it claims to believe the Bible. Prophet Muhammad was influenced greatly by the peoples of the book he would speak of. The peoples of the book would be Jews and Christians. He claimed to believe those books. thing is, he wasn't literate enough to know what it said except people tell it to him. And sometimes he got, his, uh, he got confused about the facts. He contradicts the Bible only because he wasn't literate, uh, literate enough to go check it before he made his statement. He contradicts the Bible over and over even though he claims to believe it and that everybody ought to believe it. 
It's a jumbled mess when you start reading it. It has no continuity, no uh, chronological order, no happenings that you can say, here's how this fits, here's how this fits. There's just a lot of, it's just a jumbled mess. There's sayings, but there's no continuity of theme and chronological positioning of those sayings. Nothing to compare it with, except when it does get some of the facts about the Bible right. But what about when it gets some of the facts of the Bible wrong? And it does that. It says, for example, that Jesus in Surah 4, 157, jot that down and make a note of it and go check it out. It says that Jesus was not crucified. But in Surah 5, verse 47, just one Surah later, it says that we ought to believe the, the people, we ought to believe the Gospels. The people of the book have given us something that God will use to judge us, he said. Well, those Gospels tell us Jesus was crucified. So if he's wrong about the crucifixion, but right about the Gospels, then he himself is wrong. And so the Koran is self-contradicting. That is not characteristic of something that you would believe came from an all-wise, almighty God. The evidence of the Book of Mormon, they've got a few prophecies, a few attempted prophecies, but they failed in them. So that tells you something. In addition to that, it quotes 1611, even though it's claiming that it was written in the 700s. How did you, how did you get 1611 Bible uh, English into 700? And then in the 1800s, you, you've got 1611 language still brought from the 700s in. It is simply a mess when it comes to the evidence of the Book of Mormon. It doesn't have the internal evidence. The external test. The Bible is historically accurate. When it talks about kingdoms, when it talks about the children of Israel, when it talks about Israel in Egypt, when it talks about Israel in the wilderness, when it talks about Israel coming to the promised land, when it talks about the nature of that land, when it talks about other nations like Assyria and, and, uh, uh, and Babylon and, and uh, other nations coming in to, uh, to fight or to do battle with them, it's historically accurate in everything that it says. geographically accurate when it says going up to Jerusalem. It doesn't matter the direction you're going up to Jerusalem. If you're going from the north, you're still going to go up to, to Jerusalem even though you're traveling south. Geographically accurate in all that it says. Archaeological verifications keep on mounting. You don't get to take any of the archaeological evidence away and dismiss it. It's still there. And it's getting better as we discover more things. But you don't find that, though, with the Koran. It's historically inaccurate. It claims things like Alexander the Great was a true prophet of God. It calls Mary, the mother of Jesus, the sister of Aaron. That was just an indication he got his facts and chronological uh, fact details way out of order. It shows that he was illiterate. He confused his facts because he was relying upon his memory of Bible facts. And thus, when he says something, it demonstrates he's not a prophet of God, for God wouldn't allow a prophet of God to make those kinds of mistakes. So we test the Book of Mormon the same way. There is no historical support. Except when they lift verses from the Bible, those verses are correct. No archaeological verification. No geographical accuracy. It talks about places that still haven't discovered those places. It talks about biblical places about the only time it gets anything right. 
And so our conclusion is that only the Bible passes the tests. Remember those three tests. Only the Bible passes those tests. Now, I called your attention to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 a moment ago and says, You be ready to give an answer for the reason of your hope. But look with me in 2 Peter now. 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes about people who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 3 that His divine power has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by the glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And then he goes on in verse 16 to talk about the fact that, that we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. We're talking about something that is credible from the get-go, from, from the very start. And from the start to the finish, it's been credible. And it prophesied Jesus and showed that Jesus came, that He was the prophesied one, and eyewitnesses laid their lives on the line to tell it. And then they tell us, you've got great and precious promises here. You have a wonderful opportunity to hear. And you have an opportunity to believe the evidence. Because it's evidence based. Prophecy, Old Testament, New Testament eyewitness testimony. And so the credibility and the power of that evidence is right in your hands and it's saying, we just want to give you eternal life. I want you to have it. And you can have it through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you want to be a part of that, and we can help you this morning, please don't harden your heart. And if you have other questions about these things, please don't hesitate to ask. And we'd be glad to study these things with you further. But if you believe...